Hello, I'm Doug DeWitt, Transfer Paper Product Manager here at Condi Systems, welcoming you into our next video on our series on Oki Data White Toner Printing. In this video, we're talking about translating artwork for the Forever Transfer RIP software, one of the hurdles or obstacles that you have to overcome in order to achieve successful white toner printing. Now, when we're talking about translating artwork for the Forever Transfer RIP, Essentially, what we have to do is establish some definitions as far as well, how exactly do we define vector artwork? What's the difference between a vector file and a raster file and how that translates through the RIP into your output on your white toner printer? We've also got to figure out what are acceptable file formats that we can send to the RIP because the RIP doesn't work with every graphic software application that's out there. Um, although with this particular topic, uh, we're going to focus primarily on Adobe Photoshop. Uh, we're also going to talk about white as not only just a spot color, but as a background color. And understanding the difference as far as dictating white is laid down, you know, as a spot color through your graphic software, as background color through the RIP. And we're going to talk about some of the color adjustment features that are in the Forever Transfer RIP compared those to what you might find in Adobe Photoshop. And we're also going to address the issue of the screening functions within the RIP. Now, anybody who tuned in to yesterday's pilot episode of the T-Shirt Transfer Paper Power Half Hour, with yours truly, got an advance on that topic as far as the different screening options within the RIP. Uh, we're going to get into some more detail here. And to get into that, that kind of detail, we need to bring in an expert, because when it comes to my knowledge of graphic software applications, I have to admit that I'm a novice. I don't know much about graphic software, I just know how to make the printers and the RIP run. So everything that I've kind of learned, I've kind of learned from trial and error and tips and tricks from friends of mine in the industry. So in order to go over some of these aspects with you, I wanted to bring in a heavyweight, uh, a guy who I consider to be an outstanding graphic artist. Uh, if you've gone to in the, in the, any of the industry trade shows, if you have attended organizations like SGIA, if you've been to an ISS or an Impressions Expo show, uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. And I'm really happy to have him with me today. Uh, this is Dane Clement from Great Dane Graphics. Hey, Dane, can you hear me? Hey, Doug, hear you fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, man. I am right. so Good. happy to see you, especially after the events of last week. Uh, first off, want to let everyone in the audience know that we had to postpone this segment for about a week because, you know, for us who live along the Gulf Coast, it's just that time of year where we have to play dodge, duck, dip, dive, dodge when it comes to <laughs> tropical storms and hurricanes. Now, you guys based there in Covington, you know, did you make out okay? Uh, how's yeah. everyone there? We were good, thank goodness, right? But Unfortunately, fortunate for us, uh, you know, moved a little west, but unfortunate for the guys in Lake Charles, they got slammed. Yeah. It was, uh, it, was a, it just blew up so fast. It was not good. And we had two back to back. So that was the crazy part. Yeah. Very unusual, you know, even for the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I know that when people see, you know, footage of the type of destruction that these things can do, uh, you know, especially with us living along the coast, it's almost like going through war. You know, you really can't talk about it until you experience it. But just as a side note, if anybody out there did see the footage of what happened in Louisiana and Texas and Arkansas and feels compelled to do something about it, to donate, to help a good cause, to help fellow Americans, uh, just as a Gulf Coast resident, I can tell you the best way to donate is through the American Red Cross Disaster Relief Fund. So I just want to mention it here before we get started, if you feel compelled, uh, visit the American Red Cross website, uh, look up their disaster relief fund link, uh, give generously. Uh, that money is the best avenue to get help to people on the Gulf Coast who need it. So uh, really Dane, good. glad to hear that you are okay, my man. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, what I want to do is get right to the book. Um, we got a hold of this book a couple of months ago, read through it, and you were okay. It is just absolutely amazing. Uh, the title is Artwork for White Toner Transfers. And look at there, Dane, it's even got your name on it. 
Uh, <laughs> first off, congrats on the book, man. Uh, uh, thanks. As far as someone like me, who is a novice Photoshop user, Illustrator user, a uh, few things that I love about the book personally. One, sometimes it's difficult to explain these concepts in layman's terms so that, you know, newbies to graphic software like me can kind of get their mind around it and understand. But I thought you did a great job of that. And the lesson plans that you laid out in this thing, you know, with some books that we see out there, you know, they're so deep in lessons plans, you know, it, it's hard to make heads or tails of anything. Just from a personal note, what I appreciate about the book is the lessons that you lay out may not address every single graphic design issue that you may run through. But as someone working with a white toner system, you know, with that system in mind, I'm telling you, man, these lesson plans will get you through about 95% of your day. Uh, I was really impressed with how they were laid out. So I guess the first thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, as far as putting this book together, um, you know, it kind of tells me that white toner printing is gaining some legitimacy if graphic artists such as yourselves are paying attention to it you know, creating these fine educational products. I mean, was that your motivation or was there something else behind it? No, it was definitely most of it. That was definitely part of it, right? So yeah. um, my motivation is I get, like you mentioned earlier, I speak at all all the industry trade shows. I'm always there, I'm involved, I'm, I'm connected. I write, in, write for Impressions Magazine. I get questions all the time. And a lot of those questions were built around the white toner space. Um, some people struggle with it big time and still to this day struggle with it. And, but there's certain things you can do to make it easier and when, on the art side, at least. Right. And, I'm, and that's what my specialty is. I mean, this book is only one in a series of six or eight books that we're going to have done here uh, once we're finished um, with the series. I mean, we got artwork with vinyl cutting, you know, DTG, screen print things, uh, working on a, a die sub right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, training and teaching the artwork is what I love. I, I do much more so love being in a one big room with a hundred people, right? That's me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I get to watch everybody's faces and watch the light bulbs turn on and it's so much fun for me. Uh, but this is, you know, I guess next best thing, right? I can't see everybody that's watching. Um, sorry. <laughs> I wish I could, cause that's, that's what makes it so much more fun. But, um, but that's where the book came from. It came from me seeing and hearing the struggles that people were having with the uh, technology. And I think yeah. it's an awesome technology. It's got a, it's a, it's another tool for your toolbox, right? So if you do die sub work, um, which is fantastic, it's actually my favorite decorating technique because of the color vibrancies and stuff. Um, but it's just another thing that allows you to do hard goods and you can make things that are not on white backgrounds, right? You can, do, you know, put them on all kinds of materials and substrates and whatnot. So it's a, it's a great, um, a great technique. I love it. Yeah, it's a great technique. And, you know, of course, part of the technique is if you set your artwork up properly, then once you employ the rip and the transfer paper, you get a finished product that looks outstanding. But it all starts with setting up your artwork properly. And, you know, from my level of expertise, you know, that's the one avenue I've always struggled with, with getting, you know, someone brand new into this kind of up and running. You know, we can help them from the production side, from the manufacturing side. But as far as the artwork design, it's tough because, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty much a self-taught novice, so to speak. So when you're putting this book together, you know, kind of like I said, you know, you're, you know, it appeals to someone like me. I mean, is this a... Is this a manual for someone who has a little bit of experience with Photoshop or Illustrator? Can someone who is, you know, just installed it today, you know, go through these lessons and get a leg up, so to speak? So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it works for someone like me. Uh, would it work for someone, let's say, like below my skill level or maybe lessons in here that should be employed for people above my skill level? Right. So that's it exactly, right? So it's designed, the book is designed, the way I teach in general, right? In my seminars, if I'm doing it live or whatever, my video training, I teach things in the way that I think anyways, which I've, I've been successful at it this long. 
to where I can, if you've never opened Photoshop before or whatever the program is that I'm going to show you, mm -hmm. uh, this one will be working Photoshop today. Uh, if you've never opened it before, the book comes in, in handy because it literally walks you through. It says file open and then go to this menu and then do that and then go here and do this. I mean, it's very, very uh, simplified and specific. So it's great for the newbie. Uh, if you're just buying one of these printers and now have a clue as far as what you can do with artwork, uh, it's a perfect venue for you. Now, there's also a bunch of lessons in here that sort of ramp up in the skill set or in the, uh, the complexity. I don't even like that word necessarily for it, but uh, it's a, it's kind of a good one. It's like there is different levels. It's built for the novice and built for somebody that's been at it for a while because some of the techniques that I show are very simple step-by-step -step things, but they're very high-end results stuff at the back end, right? So when you're looking at something or if you have to optimize a file or if you're going to rasterize for colored shirts, right? Those things are not known all over the place and not everybody understands how to do it. There's 10 ways to do everything in Photoshop. But if you did it this way, you can get some killer results by just following the recipe, right? It's like making a gumbo. Just do that recipe that your grandma gave you, right? Ooh, all the way through. Yeah, and then man. you got some good stuff at the back end of it. Well, you know, every good gumbo starts with a good roux. I mean, <laughs> and, you right. know, anybody who's never had true Louisiana gumbo, just so you know, you got to start oh, with a good Oh, too bad. Roux. Well, next time you're around town, gonna, you gotta, I'll hook you up. Yeah, well, uh, we for sure. That. You know, and speaking of the roux, so to speak, you know, the way that the book lays out the tools that are available in Photoshop and labels all the tools. And when you're going into an individual lesson, you know, the file drop downs that, you know, basically help you, so to speak, steer you in the right direction. Because, you know, sometimes these programs, because they can do so much, you kind of get stuck with where you begin. Um, right. Where I would like to begin here is, you know, we talk about the types of art files that we're bringing into a RIP. Uh, first off, you know, for anyone out there who's just getting started, you know, I think the first thing that you need to do is kind of explain the difference between vectorized artwork and rasterized artwork. And I mean, I've got my layman's definition of the two. But, you know, you're a better expert than I am. Give us your layman's definition of the sure. difference between vector yeah. artwork and raster artwork. Right. So, so before I do that, two seconds on what, the point you just made a minute ago. You were talking about the, um, uh, oh, jeez, look how fast I'm Labeling lost the menus and. Yeah. Anyways, so. As far as the vector and the raster, oh, I remember what it was. See, that's what it got. That's how it gets. <laughs> <laughs> so, we were, we were talking about um, the 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 menus and the things and the it that that I show talk about in the book, right? I show you here's a menu, here's how it lays out. This is what you do next. Um, what that does is it only focuses on the part of Photoshop that you need, mm -hmm. right? Photoshop is so big and hairy and scary; it intimidates everybody. Yeah. or somebody new to it, right? They're very, very intimidated. And if you just remember that I don't need 90% of it for what we're doing, I need this much of it. So it, it just sort of takes the, the, you know, the anxiety factor down because you don't have to learn everything in Photoshop. I don't even know everything in Photoshop. It does all kinds of stuff, right? But I know what I need to do to get through all of my decorating techniques and so just keep that in mind when, when, when you're thinking about getting into this. If you want to do it, if you've never played with it before, it's one of those things where it's not as bad or as intimidating if you think about it in those small bite-sized pieces. Well, now, absolutely. on the raster there's, versus vector. Yeah, this, I was going to say there's being a graphic artist and then there's being a graphic artist that gets paid. And basically the difference between the two is being able to produce the artwork with enough quality, but with enough time and speed that you're not basically driving up your labor, so to speak, laboring through the artwork process. So yeah, right. let's get back to vector versus raster. Like I yeah. said, man, give us your layman's definitions of the two. Absolutely. Do it all the time, right? So there's basically in the art world and in our industry, there's two types of artwork you need to concern yourself with. One is vector art. One is raster art. Now, almost everybody, for some weird reason, I guess maybe because it's been around 
not longer because it's been around the same amount of time, but more popular is the word vector, right? They, they, they hear that word and it becomes an earworm word. Like, oh, I need vector art. I need vector art. Mm -hmm. And they get stuck in that mode. So is this, you know, when they would come to our booths and stuff, they'd flip through our books. Man, this stuff is great. Is this vector art? I'm like, eh, no, we got some vector, but it's not, you know, you just need to know too. And with the stuff I'm going to show you today, you'll be able to get the raster piece of it done, a piece of cake. So when it comes to vector, what that is, is a, it's created with nodes, right? So you're an illustrator or a Corel draw or many other ones, but you can create the artwork by clicking your mouse and makes a node, right? You move your mouse and you click it again and it it draws a line. It could be a straight line, a curved line or whatever, but it's it's just, it's a point in lines and like nodes in lines. And it, every when you're finished, if you created that thing at two inches, a vector file can be scaled up infinitely. So you can make it the size of a building and it's super clean because what it does is just recalculates the math. So I said before I had a two inch space between my two nodes, right, for instance, and now it's got, you know, 25 feet. I'm just going to recalculate and draw a longer line in between the two. So it doesn't really matter uh, sizing issues. There's no limitations there. Um, some of the limitations that they do have, in my opinion anyway, is some of the artwork has a very flat look. And not, not, I don't mean to knock it, but I'm just saying that these are the things that you got to concern yourself with. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to print to a digital printer, for instance, if you have large, solid, flat areas or coverages in your design, you can have some, may have some issues with that, right? It may have a line going through. It may have a scan line. DTGs have problems. You know, off, uh, large format printers, uh, if you lose a couple of nozzles on those inkjets, you know, you can see banding and things like that. Uh, and then when it comes to raster artwork, most people don't realize what a raster file is. So if you ask them, hey, well, you know what a raster art file is? I can ask 100 people in my classes. Sometimes, man, yeah, four or five, maybe six hands go up. And everybody else just sits there and looks at me. But I can tell you this, everybody knows what a raster file is. Because if you ever have one of these in your purse or your pocket and you've ever taken a picture, you just created a raster file. All it is is a pixel-based image, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, the differences between the two is, one, it's a continuous tone and it's pixel-based, so it's finite. When I take that picture, there's so much data in that file, right? That is, that is it. It starts out with whatever settings you have uh, set. Uh, whatever settings you save it as, things like that. So it is um, a finite file. So I can't necessarily take that file and blow it up the size of a the side of, uh, the side of a building uh, like I can with a vector file and have the same quality. But depending on what I'm designing for, I can absolutely make sure I'm set up properly in the beginning to decorate anything we need to decorate. We have customers that use our stuff for. Uh, wrapping cars, you know, vehicles, uh, signage, large format sign stuff. So it works if you do it right in the beginning. And that's what I'm going to show uh, how to set that up today. Yeah, because, you know, my layman's terms, especially when it comes to a raster file, you know, what I always try to tell people is you've got a certain number of dots there. If you double the size, the physical size of the file, you're basically cutting your resolution in half, you mm -hmm. know? So if you blow it up too big, your dots get too big and it starts to look like a paint by number, so to speak. Right. It, you know, so fuzzy. there is to a certain degree, kind of like a target resolution. Now, whenever you're designing artwork for yourself in this process, you know, let's say we're dealing with a particular size, 11 by 17, eight and a half by 11 you know, these typical, you know, output sizes that we deal with. When you're working with a raster file, what target resolution do you use? I use 300 pixels per inch for everything I create. Mm -hmm. So uh, our Great Dane graphics um, stock designs, right? We create them at 14 inches by 14 inches at 300 pixels. And that's plenty big enough to do anything we need in our industry. It, it, it works. W to, to help describe what the pixels stuff is, right? So here's a for instance. I know that everybody listening or watching this thing has come across a customer that says, hey, can you take this and you know make it a size of a shirt or put it, you know, they stole some little bitty JPEG thing off the internet or, and they want right to print it 12 by, you yeah. know, 12 inches, right? And if you think of it this way, that comes in inch and a half and it's got 72 pixels per inch because that's the size they stole off the internet. So that means that the inside that finite square, remember I said, well, you have a certain amount of data and that's it. There's 72 pixels sitting next to each other. Mm 
Mm-hmm. All right. So, and it's inch and a half by inch and a half. Well, let's say they want to print, I don't know, something that's letter size or 11 by 17, like you had mentioned, like put it on a, a, a computer bag type of thing, whatever it might be. That one and a half inches has 72 pixels sitting next to each other like this. Well, now you're saying, hey, I want to take this image, but I want to make it 12 inches wide, right? So I'm going from an inch and a half to 12 inches. So it takes those pixels and literally just stretches them out and says, huh, I got to fill this in with something. So it, it literally makes, interpolates pixels. It creates pixels and creates data that does not exist. It's not there. And it fills in the two. So that's why images that are blown up that way always look soft. They're not detailed. They don't have crisp edges because it's filling in that data. And so it's just got a lot of extra made up information in there. So uh, yeah, well, that's, that that's a big problem. Inf- and I see it all the time. Yeah, that made up information definitely goes into your RIP program or into your driver. <laughs> um, it's got to basically get translated and fed to the laser printer itself with its own internal processor, known internal memory. So yeah, it creates monster files that take forever to print. And you're correct, you don't get the quality out of it. And what I always try to stress to people is we're not going on to a flat reflective surface like a piece of white metal. We're going on to a a pitted woven fabric. There's only so much resolution a t-shirt can hold anyway. So anything beyond that is overkill. I've always recommended 300 DPI as a good target. To hear you say it just kind of reinforces me like, Boy, I'm glad I didn't blow that one, you know what I mean? Um, Well, while I got you on that, you know, some of the other things that we get bombarded with, RGB versus CMYK, you know, when you're creating. Now, my personal preference, even though I know I'm working with a RIP program that processes in CMYK, me personally, I design in RGB when I am rarely called on to design, Because I think that RGB just gives you better, brighter base colors. Um, As far as you being the expert, do you have a preference one or the other? Uh, Do you think it really matters which one you design in? I think it, personally, I think it matters big time, right? And And you and I are in agreement again, because I use RGB for everything when I create my art files. When I'm creating something, um, you know, that's not old school, like a painting that you, know, you see in my studio here. Mm-hmm. If I'm painting something in Photoshop or Procreate on my iPad or something, um, that's an RGB file that I work in. Because yeah. that, look, I'm, I, I'm pointing to my monitor right now, right? That is the best my image is going to look. Because that is all these RGB pixels turned on to create the image that I'm working on going straight into my eyeballs. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm being filtered through a little glass here these days, but, you know. It goes straight into my eyeball. It's not a reflective light. It's not, it's not light that's printed on something yet and bouncing back. So once you get to that point, you lose. It degrades. Your image will degrade every step of the way. So the best you're going to get is RGB on screen. Um, most RIP software out there on all the RIPs that I've ever messed with will do a better job of taking and translating an RGB file because it reads the math and interpolates the proper colors so you're going to get more accurate, in my opinion, at least my experience for 25 some years, uh, you're going to get better color matching. It's going to, it'll match your blues and your greens will look better if you send an RGB file than a CMYK file. I've done it a hundred times and I've always struggled with the CMYK part of it. I can get it to look good. It's getting it to print good is, is the next level. That's a whole nother thing, right? So um, RGB Everything I create isn't done in RGB. And if I have to convert it, I'll let the rips convert it because they, they do a great job of that. Yeah, and you know, once we, we also got to understand that once the rips convert it, if we're using a four color white toner printer and we've got black, we're going to get a process black. So if you need the best process black you can, that's why I'm saying go with RGB. It gives you a better black. Um, You know, if you've got a fancier unit where you've got five color printing, you know, something like the 9541, you can get the true black. You know, I think you just get better, I'm going to call them black gradients or black shading with RGB than CMYK. I think the, you know, other base colors like your reds, yellows, blues, greens just tend to pop more. Um, 
you know, always worry about the translation from, you know, going from an RGB file to, to CMYK, but I agree with you. Trying to work with CMYK as your process colors, you know, to me, it just doesn't deliver the pop once it comes out of the printer, and when mm -hmm. it comes out of the printer, that's what matters. You know, so, what you see on your monitor is one thing. It's what it looks like when it comes out on the printer. Absolutely. But you can test it or you can check for yourself, right? You can take an image and create it or take a photo, whatever it is, and it's an RGB file in Photoshop and, and duplicate the window and then make that one CMYK. And depending on, sometimes it won't notice much of a difference. It just depends on the image. But you will notice on screen a step down, right? The RGB is going to have much more color because it, the space is much larger and that CMYK space is smaller. So you can see it, it's going to be brighter and richer here. And the next one is going to drop down a little bit. So if you notice that there's a step down on screen, you can only imagine once you print something, right, to a, to a paper transferred for in, in this instance, and then we're going to go ahead and smash it down on whatever it is. We got reflective lighting, but it's degrading just by the nature of having to do more than, you know, more steps. Uh, I don't mean getting horrible. I just mean stepping down a little bit. And then by the time it still looks great, but it's, it's still not where it was in the beginning. So that's an easy way to check it. Well, you know, not only that, you go through those slight incremental changes, switching from, you know, color palettes. Then you're going through a rip, which is going to translate a little different. Then you're going to the printer, which is going to translate a little different. You know, sometimes these little incremental changes, once you add them all up, comes out to a big change as far as what you're seeing yeah. on your transfer paper and what you're seeing on the monitor. Um, so yeah, man, uh, good talking points there for sure. Now, since we're covering RGB versus CMYK, uh, the other thing it kind of leads me around to is, you know, the RIP can accept all different types of file formats. Uh, and one fortunate thing about the transfer RIP is it can work with native Photoshop files. Um, you know, me personally, whenever I was working with a vector design and I wanted to bring it into the RIP, I would basically save it as a PDF uh, just because it's easy. Um, whenever I'm working with some type of raster file, I usually save it as a PNG with a transparent background because we got to be mindful of having a white background uh, with a raster file format. Um, as far as those file formats are concerned, are they good file formats? Is there any other file format that will, let's say, capture more detail, give us a better result? Uh, no, I don't think there's, there, it wouldn't capture, other file formats won't necessarily capture more detail, but they, ha they handle the information that's within them differently. So you'd mentioned PDF, it's a great file, I use it a lot. Um, but when it comes to my work like this, any kind of image data, that I have one specific workflow. I work in Photoshop and I will keep a Photoshop document with all my layers and that sort of thing as I create the file, right? So I may have a bunch of text and other elements, might have 20 layers or something. Um, that stays as a Photoshop document, but when I'm ready to go print something and send it to RIPS, I just save it as a PNG. And I've been doing that workflow forever for dye sublimation work. When I send stuff to the DTG printer, I'll save it as a PNG. So it's kind of my main workflow always, so I just stick with it. This technology is no different because the RIPs handle them beautifully. So if you can start doing things in one simplified way, uh, it becomes second nature and kind of a habit to you and you just bang them out. And uh, the PNG, since it does have transparent pixels in it, is an awesome file because you can have a high res file at a fairly low resolution or, or size, you know, fat size. So um, it works, it works great. And that's, that's what I would recommend across the board for everything you do. When you're yeah, going to print something, save that's it as definitely a PNG. good news good to, to hear. Um, because like I said, that's, that's the file format that I recommend, you know, mainly because you had, you had mentioned the, the transparent pixels. Uh, it kind of leads me into, you know, people who first get into this technology, you know, the typical scenario is a client is going to send you their company logo that they want on a garment and odds are they're going to send it to you in a JPEG mm -hmm. format which yep. is going to have a white background. Now, if we're sublimation printing, if we're doing standard four color process printing, that's no big deal because those printers cannot physically generate white. 
but a white toner printer can definitely see that white JPEG. And the most common call I get is, I've got this white box around my logo. So at that point, it's explaining to people the value of working with a, a PNG, you know, transparent background format, but there's also the process of removing that white background. Now, right. you know, I, I have had some very basic ways that I have done it. I've made a video or two where, you know, the, my first attempt, I used the magic wand tool in Photoshop because it was the one tool that I easily recognized and I had a vague idea on how to use it. But, you know, the techniques that you lay out are obviously much better because what we got to consider is when we're removing that white background is what I'm going to call the edge pixels, you know, around your design that sometimes you may not get all the way to the edge. There may be some pixelated white around that design. Uh, there may be some invisible pixels that the rip wants to put a white dot behind where you don't intend it to be. So um, I would say if there is like one lesson that everybody dealing with some type of white printing system, whether it's this or DTG needs to learn, is how to basically take an image from a white background in a JPEG or, or wipe that out. Now, right. I'm hoping you can accommodate us today by giving us a quick overview of Dane Clement's best way to do that. Right, so I can, and I, I will show you, you mentioned Magic Wand. Um, Scott Kelby from Kelby One, he's a Photoshop guy. I get Photoshop user magazines, been doing it since they came out, right? Right. And um, he had he calls this he calls the magic wand the tragic wand because it's terrible, <laughs> but it does do that one instance really really good. So if you have a hard edged object, right, like this my phone, it's got a it's got a hard edge, and it's super easy. That's a great tool to use, uh, and I can show it to you how I would handle uh, you know a simple logo type of situation and get rid of that background using it. Um, I'll show in the book, we get way more advanced on how to remove faded edges and things. And I can, you know, show. Well, a that's bit just of that. it. You know, right. when you're talking about graphics with a faded edge or, you know, any kind of halftone transition or, you know, there's white close to the shade that you're trying to eliminate. You know, you got to mess around with the tolerance settings. It's not exact. Sometimes you end up removing white that you didn't intend to remove. So. Yeah. You know, like I said, the magic wand was just the, you know, basic for dummies tool that I figured out on how to do it. But, sure. you know, there's always better ways and probably easier ways. Well, actually, it's my go-to for simple stuff. If it's got a hard edge, it's my go-to. But if it doesn't, then I definitely use alpha channels and stuff like that, and which is all in detail in the book. But we can, uh, I can show you what we got time for kind of thing. You know? Yeah, man. Uh, if, if you got something that will help everyone move along, uh, we'd love to see it. All right. Let's take a look here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can you see me? We can see you. All right. Let's go ahead and find a file. Hey, you know what, Doug? Before I do that, can we jump back real quick while I have this new document here? Yeah, it's bright. Can you make us jump back? No, 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 no. You stay here. I'm just going to show, I want to show something from a previous talking point we had. Okay, go. So I'm in Photoshop, right? So I'm going to go to Photoshop, I'll uh, go to file new. We talked about the resolutions and how to set up a file. So this little right hand side of this window mm -hmm. is all you need to do in order to set up your file properly. So I'd like to cover that in like 10 seconds. So Please. Uh, 14 inches by 14 inches is what we create everything we do at, right? So I can guarantee you, if you create your artwork with those sizes, it will be, it will work. No problem. My resolution is 300 pixels per inch. I use RGB color. Uh, now right here is background contents. If you've just installed Photoshop or whatever, it's going to show you as white as the background. Don't do it. You want to make sure you click here and go to transparent. Because if you don't and you start creating on that white background, you're going to have to remove stuff off that white background like I'm going to show you here in a minute. But 
if you if you get rid of it in the beginning, you won't have to worry about it. So that's it. This is all you need to do to make sure you have a raster file that's set up properly for white toner printing, DTG printing, screen printing, no matter what you're working on, that's plenty enough to get it all done. Yeah, so, so basically, yeah, you set up in a transparent second. background, you just need to dictate where white prints. Exactly. So when I hit create, you see these gray and white checkers? That is every software out there's way of presenting transparent pixels. So if I see a gray and white checkered background here, then I know that's a transparent background. So that means everything I put on top of it is gonna be on its own layers. So let's just wanted to show that because it's very important and it's super simple, right? Again, that anxiety factor of having too much to worry about. Um, and I'm gonna open this guy. And this is going to be one of my go-tos where if I see something like this, a logo given to me, vector artwork, uh, I can look up here at the top. It's a JPEG file, right? Right. <clears throat> I need to uh, get it off this white background. So this is one of those instances where looking at my art, that's hard edge stuff. I'm going to go ahead and use my magic wand tool or the tragic wand tool, as Scott Kelby calls it. <laughs> so first thing you need to do is I come over here and uh, click on this little lock in my layers palette. So if your layers aren't open, you go to windows, come down to layers, make sure that there it's there. Uh, and it, that lock disappears. So right now we'll be able to select certain areas, delete them, and then have a transparent background. So, um, so here's a, for instance, if I do that, I can go in here and grab my magic wand tool, right? So I'm going to come in and just click on this background. Now, I'm clicked on the white background and notice it only grabbed it around the outside edge. It stopped at this orange line. Um, that's because I have contiguous checked, right? So I think it makes it a little bit easier to do it when you do it that way, but sometimes it'll be multiple steps. Here's, here's what I mean. So I'm going to deselect that and I'm going to uncheck this contiguous box. Now I'm going to go ahead and click here and do that. So now look, I clicked in the same spot on a white background, but all kinds of stuff is uh, selected. Yeah. And that's all the white in my image. So that's if that's what I want to do, great. Boom, hit the delete key. I deselect it, and my image is clean of, of white. But I want the white in my waves and in the fish, right? I don't want it back here, and I don't want it, you know, anywhere else necessarily. So this is how I would do that. If I With the uh, magic wand tool, same thing. If I come in here, now watch. If I click in this transparent pixel, see, it creates, it, it selects everything. Don't want to do that. So I want to click on this contiguous button in this instance, and I'm going to click here, and it just basically grabs this uh, fish itself, right? So I want to zoom in because I want this part. If I hold my shift key down, by the way, I can, I can shift click and add to my selections. So I'm going to do the same thing there. I want to get this little piece of white on the wave, this one and this one. So that's the only place I want to have white uh, necessarily, like to show as white. Um, so what I can do is I can do two things. I can just fill this with white right here on this layer. Uh, if you do that, you might notice when it prints some of that anti-alias pixels that you were talking about, how the RIP sometime wants, sometimes wants to add a white pixel or little white bits and pieces here and there. Uh, right. So a way that you can at least avoid a bunch of that is to come over here and create a new layer, right? And I'm going to put it beneath the artwork layer. Uh, so now if I look at my foreground color is black and white. If I hit this little uh, arrow thing or just hit the X key to exchange my foreground and background colors, um, it's going to do that. Now I can come in here and I can fill it with the paint bucket tool. I can go to edit fill. And then if I did that, right, if I go to edit fill and I want to, I'd have to come in here and choose foreground color because my foreground color is what, I mean, it's a lot of steps. Uh, all you have to do is hit command D or, uh, uh, control backspace on your computer, option backspace, sorry, and then alt back, alt delete uh, on a PC to get that to fill in. So if you do it this way, de deselect it now, right? So now let's just go ahead and create a new layer and let's just find a color that this might go on. I don't know, maybe like a, one of those fishing shirts, seafoam green, why not? Just for yeah, fun. Yeah, that would be a typical design on seafoam green. Right. So that looks 
Pretty cool. So what I can do is I'm going to turn off this eyeball, by the way, because I don't want to merge those together since we just took everything off that background. Right. But if I, if I select this top layer and I come over the little fly out menu, I can merge down. And what that'll do is it'll take the white layer that we had and just merge it with the one right above it. Or as long as you select that, whatever layer you want to merge down, it'll just do one layer. Uh, if you do like merge visible or something, it'll take them all, right? So, so right now, this image, if I go back to this, that's what I'm looking for. I just wanted the white to be gone, except if I want white in my logo, obviously I need to have the white in there. So um, I still use this tragic one all the time. Uh, if it's something like this, because it's fast and it's easy and it's, I get good results and I get it done, you know, banging them out. Um, let me go ahead and open up a different file for you and show you how show you what it can be to get a little bit more uh, complicated, right? Let's see what we got here. So for instance, this guy, let's open this one. So this is a, an image that's flattened on a white background. Well, look at the edges here, right? See how soft they are? Right. They're really soft and faded and it's no hard edges. So if I took my magic wand tool and did that, I can do this, and then if I if I go to select menu, I can inverse my selection, right? And if I hit Command J or Control J on your PC, it's just going to give it to me on its own layer. Now I can turn my back la background background layer off, and I can see my image. But if you look, if I put a color behind it, look at that. Yeah, yeah. terrible. This is the stuff and the the reasons why the magic wand is a bad tool or doesn't work very well in this instance. Uh, but if you got a hard edge on, if I got rid of that sky and it was just that uh, that parrot, right, with all those hard edges, it worked like a champ. So as, as long as you know what tool to use when you need to use it, um, you can it, you can do it super easy. So this is uh, what that guy looks like as it should with its soft edges and faded edges into the background to, off that white background. So and it takes a little too long for this time this class here, but. That, that is in the book detailed be detailed out so yeah and that's the effect that <laughs> most people want to achieve when they're working with this now when we're working in the rip you know we can do a few things to correct to correct some issues like that but the rip doesn't fix everything uh, you know basically what people need to understand is the rip is a processing program it's not a graphics application program. We could do some graphic work in the RIP, but not everything. There are going to be some things that are going to be better served working in Photoshop. So let me do this for you guys. Uh, I'm going to get Sprite to jump us over to our Forever Transfer RIP. I appreciate you doing that, Sprite. So first, let me go ahead and pick a profile. Um, I'm going to work with the forever low temp laser dark profile color settings uh, primarily that's what most people tend to print anyway and then what we're going to do here uh, let's go ahead and take another piece of great dane artwork uh, your sherwood owl here uh, just to kind of show people some of the things that we can do as far as color correction and color management once you have your graphic within the RIP. Now, to point out here, we've got some basic color control tools. For instance, we can adjust brightness on a slide scale. It gives us a little bit of a preview so we can see how the effect plays out. And we can make those adjustments. We can play around with the contrast of the design. Uh, one thing that I have noticed is whenever I bring in a raster art file, uh, when we go to print, they usually have a tendency to print a little darker than what I would intend. So just as a rule of thumb, what I usually do is I'll increase the brightness a few points um, I'll also increase the saturation if I know I'm going on to a darker garment. If I'm going on to a lighter garment, I might drop that saturation. Um, we do have individual gamma controls. So we can control cyan, magenta, yellow, and black gamma. 
Now, me personally, Dane, I never mess with the gamma controls because when you play with one gamma process color in theory, you're affecting all your colors in your palette, correct? That's not theory. That's absolute. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those, I reserve these sliders for what I call the super advanced graphic artists, those people like yourself. Uh, but just to show you some of the other things that we can do here in the RIP, uh, what I think is a fairly neat tool and fairly simple is we can simulate the background substrate color, so to speak. So we can kind of get an idea of what our artwork will look like going against particular backgrounds. Now, of course, this only works if we're dealing with an art file that has a transparent background. Again, another reason to employ transparent background file formats like PNGs. Now, what I think is a limitation, so to speak, of the RIP and you know, I'm just going to kind of play around here. Uh, we can remove a color, which I think is a decent feature, so to speak, if we're talking about just one isolated color. And normally I would recommend this, like, for instance, if we were going on to this shade of yellow, um, we can click on our Remove Color tool, and it's going to bring up a dialog box. And I'm going to show people what it looks like here. We can isolate that shade of yellow with a mouse click. Gives us the CMYK value of what to isolate. And we can save it. And then, kind of like the magic wand tool, we've got a tolerance meter here so that as we start to increase the tolerance, we can start to remove more and more shades around the one that we picked. Now, as far as removing color, I think it's a pretty, pretty simple tool to use. Um, if you need to reset it, just as an FYI, we reset all of our, go to remove color, and it keeps throwing onto another screen. And I've got to find my mouse. At least Sprite's not fighting me with the mouse this time. You should have seen our last show. Oh my goodness. It was one of the best mice fights ever recorded. Mises. Okay, so Ooh, by the way, if we says. set the CMYK back to zero, we turn the feature off. Now, just to kind of show you, Dane, um, they do have a replacement color feature, okay? So what we could do is we can click into the RIP, and it's going to pull another dialog box that looks like this. So what I can do is say I want to identify the source color. I can pick that shade of yellow. Now, once I've identified the source color to replace, I can select a destination color, let's say like here in the design. Let's say I wanted that particular shade. I can go ahead and save it, but you see what it does it replaces all the colors that are that particular shade. Now, of course, I can readjust the tolerance, but like I said, it's not what I would consider to be an accurate, you know, color swapping tool, um, which is basically why I tell people, if you got to make adjustments like this, it's much easier to do it in your graphic software than in your RIP program, because like I said, RIP programs as we could tell by this quick little demonstration, aren't necessarily designed for color management. They're designed to rip files, so to speak. Now, interesting, when we do get to the screening options, you know, with the rip, we've got what we call screening from printer, which 
in case anybody didn't catch our last episode or didn't catch our episode yesterday, if we selected this option, it means that the RIP is going to print the graphic as if it were to come straight from the driver. So in other words, there's not going to be any type of distress pattern or pinhole pattern or any kind of rasterization or screening to the graphic. It's going to print as a solid graphic. Now here in the RIP, we have what's called, what they call a mask, okay? Now, as I explained to the audience yesterday, Dane, you know, there are Germans who wrote the program, so these are German explanations as to what's going on. Um, but basically, when we mask for bright media, we're telling the RIP that we are going on to a white t-shirt. So what the RIP essentially does is it knocks out the white and light areas of the design and gives them more of a perforation than, let's say, darker areas, which it tends to print more intact. We get the opposite effect when we screen for dark media, which is basically telling the RIP program that we're going to a black T-shirt. So if there are any areas in the design which are solid black, the RIP isn't even going to print them. Uh, the darker areas have more perforation. As we go from darker to lighter shades, we get less perforation. When we get to solid white, it's not perforated at all. Now, if we're going on to a black t-shirt or a white t-shirt most of the time, well, basically, we can do a one-click screening and basically set up what I would consider to be the ultimate raster image for your best success of achieving a soft, flexible, durable, detailed garment. Now, the tragedy to me, so to speak, is when we are dealing with a color garment that is not black and it is not white. You know, in other words, it's some color like yellow, blue, green, orange, purple, brown, you know, khaki, you know, all the different colors in the rainbow, so to speak. We can't mask for every color within the RIP. So with the transfer RIP, the generic, so to speak, is this micro mask feature where it puts an even perforation across the entire design. Now, where we can run into issues there is you know, sometimes you might have lettering in your design that you don't want perforated. Um, sometimes there are shades that, you know, maybe deserve more perforation than less depending on the background color that you're using. So, in other words, the RIP does a good job if you're going to a black t-shirt or a white t-shirt. As far as a color t-shirt is concerned, like I said, what I usually recommend to people is using the micro mask because it leaves every color intact, but it's also going to add an even perforation amount where depending on the artwork, you may not necessarily need that. So, you know, in other words, it takes someone pretty proficient in Photoshop to be able to essentially lay out their artwork knowing that the artwork is going on a fire engine red garment. You know, like I said, in the rip, we can knock out a particular shade of red, but it knocks out all red. It may not knock out one particular area. Um, like I said, the rip really can account for different various shadings of color within the garment itself. All it can really account for is black and white. Now, that being said, what I've always told people is, well, if you know how to set up your artwork for, let's say, going against a green background, or a gold background, or a blue background, or a red background, that essentially you can achieve a very similar effect to what the rip can do without necessarily going through the rip. Now, the book goes into great detail about it, and I appreciate the book doing that. Um, we probably don't have time to share all those details, but can you give us a visual of how those effects play out when you're talking about mapping your artwork for a color background, not a black or white background?
Sure. Yeah. And, and I, I do do that in depth in the book, right? So um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen because some of the samples I'm going to show you is, is it, it's all done in Photoshop. And in my opinion, you have much more control uh, over um, what you want to do, right? So here's a, for instance, this is the, this is the shirt or the image that you're using, right? And, and this is the shirt that I use on the cover of my book. Um, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take all these guys and open them in Photoshop and we'll go through them real quick one by one to show you all the differences. So all kinds of different background colors. And when you take the artwork and you rasterize it to remove that background color, just re think of, how much open space you're going to have and how soft the hands are going to be on that shirt, right? So this one here, uh, this is on a red background. So we're thinking red shirt for this. All the red you see here is knocked out. There is no, there's nothing but shirt right here, right? Yeah. And yeah, sorry, good. Oh, thought you said something. All right. So this is our original artwork, right? So this is the, the main design that we said we want to put in a red shirt when you do that. Um, you can do this and you can take a look there. That's how open this image is. This thing is going to wash great, right? It's going to have a softer hand because all that shirt's showing through. So if you don't do it this way and you do the micro screen like you're talking about or you had mentioned, um, that's a solid piece of material it's, or inks or toners or whatever it is, right? It's just a solid chunk of stuff uh, and it just makes it, I don't know, less appealing, I suppose, because it can yeah, get well, kind of heavy. You know, um, the rip will put a little bit of perforation to it, and you can control that. But yeah, you're basically filling in toner areas that you really don't need. And right. what I've always tried to teach people, the name of the game, so to speak, is to recreate the graphic accurately, but using the minimal amount of toner. Right. Look at this one. Right. This is the, the same image with it knocked out. So it's still printing the oranges and the reds where it needs to, like in the gradient and a type and things like that to give it the dimension. But the, the shirt color itself is gone, right? Yeah. So that shirt color is everywhere you see that yellow is now just open shirt, again, to help with all the benefits of, uh, of the technology. So uh, and I, I got a few other ones here. Might as well walk through. So same thing here. The greens that you see are not printed. That's all shirt showing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, like this one here, same thing, all the reds. Um, and if you take a look here, this was our original image. Got a lot of red in it. Obviously, if I'm going to print this and if I have the choice, right, I, I think it would look cool on a red shirt, which is why we did it that way. Uh, and it's super soft. All that red is wide open, just printing the, sh the shades of those reds and whatnot. So. Well, you know, the main thing is being able to lay down the tone, so to speak, so that once you put your red shirt color to the background of it, they're mixing with the tones to create the shading and the effect. Right. And that's why Photoshop, you have the control. You can control how much of the red or whatever color you're working with is eliminated much better, I think, than in a RIP software, you know, to what you were saying. Um, it just doesn't. You know, this one here, there's no green, right? Uh, so that's going to have a much more open feel. And see what else we got. Same thing here. So a lot of images, if you look at them and you say, hey, that's a pretty cool looking party parrot. I think I want to do a design for or somebody for something. Um, if you look at it and say, I can put it on a white and I can put it on, their back, on a black background and I can remove them with the rips, no problem whatsoever. But, I mean, how much nicer would it be to to have it uh, done this way, right? So it actually looks like it goes with the image because there's so much of the color in the image in the shirt. I just think it works um, really, really cool. And I think there's a one more, right? So all the reds in here obviously are, are done the same way. But um, this is my favorite, I'm just saying. <laughs> I could use a little martini right about now. Well, I was gonna say as an FYI, our vice president, uh, Mr. Lynn, uh, he is a parrot head. Uh, <laughs> All right, is, then. He's got the personalized parrot head license plate. So, yeah, as far as that art file, 
Uh, if you could shoot that one to me, buddy, uh, I can do it. That will go a long way toward office politics here. I, I'll take care of that for you today. As soon as we get out of here, not a problem. All right. Well, I tell you, Dane, I appreciate you taking the time showing people those effects because, like I said, this is something that people can do in Photoshop which circumvents what I would call a major limitation in the RIP, which is we can't screen for individual colors like we can screen for black and white. Right. Awesome. So, again, the lessons that oh. show you how to do what he just did <laughs> are here in this book, Artwork for White Toner Transfers. Uh, I'm such a firm believer in the book Whenever you buy an Oki white toner system from Condi, we are including this book with your purchase, okay? We're not going to fight you over it. We are going to force feed this book to you because we feel that the lesson plans in here are going to give you the leg up. Now, besides getting it from Condi Systems, Dane, where else could someone get this fine book? Yeah, you can get it at my website, daneclement.com, greatdangraphics.com. No problem. Now, we also have them in stock here at Condi. And yeah, you sure do. For anybody who sat through this webinar who feels, I need to get a hold of a copy of this book, um, if you want to order the book from us, it's $99. We normally charge shipping and handling, but if you mention this webinar, translating artwork for the Forever Transfer RIP, we will waive the ground delivery within the continental U.S. So buy the book, we'll ship it to you. Now, you had mentioned that you'd work, you're working on other books besides a white toner transfer book. I thought I heard you mention something about coming out with an artwork book, you know, a design book dealing with the sublimation market. Uh, yeah. Are you still working on that one, my um, man? That's what I'm working on currently. Right. So right now we're working on it. Hopefully it'll be ready. Um, probably by the end of the year, we're short staffed th these days, but, uh, but yeah, it'll be ready by the end of the year. And uh, it's the same type of book, right? It, it literally walks you through simplified, not necessarily simple designs or graphics, but simple steps to get really nice high end results. So uh, yeah, we, it's been my goal. I want to, we create, I created two books way back when t-shirt artwork simplified, right? I did one for Adobe and one for Corel. Uh, they were great books, sold a bunch. People still talk about them and, and, um, and still order the, the digital version. Uh, it was done a long time ago, but the problem with it was, in my opinion, was I can only pit, uh, fit so much in a book and I, and it was so much information I wanted to cram in there and you know, the book would have been this thick. You just can't do it. So I decided, well, instead of one all-encompassing book, let's split them up and, and focus on the decorating technique. And that way I can get down deep in the weeds for everything that that decorating technique you're going to run up against. So, uh, so that's why I'm doing it. That's, I love it. I love the teaching piece of it. And then as uh, soon as the books are done, there'll be video courses as well. But for right now, I'm still working. I got a couple more books to hammer out. But the die sub one, I'm working on as we speak. Yeah, well, when you get that Dice Sub book ready, let me know because be I got guy some critics. Talk to, bud. Boy, I got some critics that would love to review that one. Um, another thing I want to mention about your book for white toner transfers, as far as the artwork that you're using with the lesson plans, that artwork Everything is available for download so that people can play along, right? Absolutely. Every piece, of, every design that we use in the book is downloadable for somebody who buys a book for sure. Yeah, well, I tell you what, Dane. I, for one, appreciate you for writing it. Believe me, it has really kind of taught me a lot, so to speak. Uh, it has upped my game as far as being able to use Photoshop, getting artwork set up for the RIP. I'm getting better results using the lessons in this book. I know that if I can do it, anybody else out there can do it because, like I said, I am not a graphics expert. I defer to you, but I'm glad I had a graphics expert here on this webinar to explain well, glad everything. Glad to be here. I can't thank you enough for uh, participating with us. Now, just to let our audience members know, Dane, uh, we've been getting questions as the webinar has been coming in. Uh, we are going to take all those questions. Uh, we are going to create an FAQ sheet. Uh, with all the questions, uh, I'm sure there will be some. I will probably have to call Dane 
and get him to explain it to us. But long story short, we're going to take the common questions, the best questions. Uh, we're going to get you answers. Uh, we'll shoot that out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Uh, we will have this webinar recorded on our YouTube channel, Condi TV. Uh, so anything that we've covered, uh, don't hesitate to go back, watch it from the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of information in this webinar, but it's some really great points that we covered today. Dane, I appreciate your help doing it, man. I would love to have you on another webinar. I would definitely love to have you on an episode of the T-shirt transfer paper power half hour because it's just so much power fun. Uh, but again, thank you for tuning with us today. Hey, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. And for everyone out there, uh, we are going to have a third webinar in this series, uh, which is covering common errors and mistakes made with Oki White Toner Systems. So a lot of the issues that you might be running into as far as production or using your press or getting the best results on a particular fabric, that is going to be our next webinar topic. I'm going to give you all my best tips and tricks to get you guys pointed in the right direction. Hopefully this webinar went a long way toward that. I want to thank Dane Clement from Great Dane Graphics for participating with us, and I want to thank you for your time. And until next time, I'm Doug DeWitt, Transfer Paper Product Manager here at Condi Systems. Our time is up, and we thank you for yours. Thank you.